Mm -hmm. oh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the December 1st, 2023 Sandag Transportation Committee meeting. And I will um, call the meeting to order. And before we get forward, I would like uh, the interpreter to um, give us directions on how to access the interpretation. So we have Yoka. Please go ahead. Chiang. Yes, good morning. So this would be the uh, interpreter announcement. To use the interpretation feature, please scr scroll down to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish law in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you're in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Aviso por parte del intérprete para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etcétera, presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio, Silenciar Audio Original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de reunión, por favor pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Gracias. Adelante, por favor. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I'd like uh, our clerk, uh, uh, Ms. Francesca Webb, to go ahead and confirm that we have a quorum and call the roll. Thank you, Chair. For the San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Rafael Perez. Present. The City of San Diego and the County of San Diego are absent. For East County, Councilmember Shu. Here. And Councilmember Mendoza. Here. For Metropolitan Transit System, Councilmember Moreno. Present. For North County Coastal, Deputy Mayor Zito. Here. For North County Inland, uh, Mayor White should be here shortly. Uh, I will announce on the record when he does arrive. Um, and we also have Council Member Musgrove. Here. North County Transit District is absent. And for the Port of San Diego, Chairman Castellanos. Here. And for South County, Council Member Duncan. Present. Thank you. And that does complete the roll call, and we do have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and, and uh, take a uh, Public uh, member comments on non agendaized item, items. So, Francesca, do we have some members of the public who would like to speak? Thank you, Chair. We do have uh, two members of the public who'd like to speak on this item Dan Schmikowski and the original draw. Dan, you can go ahead when you're ready. My name is Dan Schmikowski. The Million Mile Man, a CBS News documentary, a candidate for mayor of the great city of San Diego. I have brought back from my home in Normandy, in France, after consulting with my friends, political leaders in Normandy, transportation, state-of-the-art tram, walkways, skyways, you, you name it. One million miles I have put on my legs. Former school teacher in San Cedro, landlord, Iron Man on three continents. The transportation goals that this committee puts forth are not only unwise, they are unattainable, like castles in the air they are a dream put forth by society, a society 
run amok. A society fearful and afraid, but not telling the truth. If everyone rode a bicycle, everyone could be a Navy field. Thank you. Your time has expired. Our next speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead when you're ready. Um, yeah, so, you know, with Newsom and his whole embarrassment um, debate last night, it's just really sad to see so many people in this state in lockstep with somebody who's destroying the state and is proud of it. And you guys are in lockstep with him doing all of the things that are destroying this county. Um, and you don't really care because you're just pushing a line. Everything is based off of, you know, fraud, waste and abuse. And it's a bunch of racketeering and, you know, just, you know, stealing the money from the people to enslave them. And it's sad because it, none of the things that you guys do helps us with transportation. And, you know, we have people like Jack who sit there and tell us that, you know, the most dangerous way to drive is alone and it's the most expensive way, right? So as long as you instill fear in the people, then they're going to, you know, either run away or they're going to comply with anything that you guys say because they feel like it's the only way. And it's sad because, you know, everything that you're doing is based off of a lie. Um, so there is no, you know, climate change like you guys speak of and you know these lithium batteries that you want to put people in are totally deadly they're i mean from the inception to the i don't even know if they ever have an end because you can't really recycle them and they're just sitting there and going to be something that could start a fire that nobody could put put out you know but nobody cares because you have an agenda to push and you only care about listening to people probably from the cop 28 and, you know, in Dubai and, and how they're going to be deciding, you know, all of these 17 sustainability goals and, and how much more we're going to implement them and how eventually, you know, you're going to make everybody be vegan. So, you know, it's just sad that you guys can continue on this and you don't do anything to help it be better. Like we actually are moving backwards in time. We're not moving forwards because at this point it's as if we should be like flying in spaceships. I mean, but right now it's like we're going back to walking and riding in carts and horses. Thank you. Your time has expired. That concludes the public comments on this item. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, let's go to uh, agency reports and update from Antoinette. Good morning. Thank you. Antoinette Meyer, your planning director here at SANDAG. I have a few updates on activities that have taken place since your, sorry about that, <laughs> last um, meeting. A little bit of a spill. One moment. <laughs> Okay, so um, the Board of Directors last month approved several um, items that will help serve the region's needs. Um, they approved an amendment to the fiscal year 2024 program budget that allocated $643 million in federal, state, and local um, revenues. And that will help to advance um, more than 30 projects throughout the San Diego region in partnership with Caltrans and all of you over the next five years. Um, progress continues on the search for the next Sandag CEO. I think you all know that Hassan's um, last stay with the agency is at the end of this month. Um, we have held two listening sessions and conducted a survey to gather feedback from the public, which will help the board um, to identify the best candidate for the position. At the board meeting um, next week on December 8th, we anticipate that the board will announce the selection for an interim CEO. Um, and then the recruitment consultant, CPS HR, will begin accepting applications for the CEO position in January. Um, we continue to do a significant amount of outreach and make progress on the 2025 regional plan. Last month, we shared with the board all of the public feedback that we've received over the course of um, the workshops that we conducted um, and all of the presentations and outreach that we've been doing in communities. And then next month, we'll be bringing an initial concept for the regional plan that reflects all of that feedback for the board to consider. Um, and then speaking of outreach, our teams continue to make great progress on two of our major infrastructure projects, and that's the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry and the Losan Rail Realignment Projects. So staff have been really busy doing workshops, engaging with community members and stakeholders um, throughout the region and across the border. So we've held multiple public workshops on the Losan Rail Alignment. They've been very well attended. We've gotten a lot of good feedback 
Um, and then Sandag's also participated in several successful visits and meetings um, to Mexico over the last couple of months to continue collaboration and, and conversations with Mexican government officials about advancing binational infrastructure projects, but specifically the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. And then last but not least, we'll be back next month with the report that you've all been waiting for on the expanded funding for FACT and specialized transportation services. We are working with the transit operators to come up with a solution um, for your consideration that we'll bring you in January. So with that, thank you, Chair. Sorry for spilling my coffee almost on you. <laughs> that concludes okay. my report. No problem. That was fine. Uh, do we have any member comments? Uh, to, oh, let's go with... Let's go with... with sure. No trans. Um, Thank you, Chair Shu. I had a couple of um, quick announcements, um, if I could. Uh, the first one is that a week from today, uh, the California State Assembly will be holding uh, a select committee on reconnecting communities will be holding its first uh, a hearing here in San Diego. Uh, the chair of this committee, and this committee was was put together by Assemblymember Alvarez. And uh, the mission of the committee is to the to review and discuss the impact of freeway construction and how it has disrupted numerous communities with a disproportionate impact on minority and low income neighborhoods and consider the state's role in implementing solutions to reconnect affected communities. So this is a very important committee with a lot of very important work and glad um, to have the first hearing here in San Diego in Barrio Logan next Friday. Uh, from 1 to 4 p.m. It's a public hearing, so everybody is invited. I hope that people will take an interest in, in attending. Uh, Sandag and Caltrans District 11 will be, will be attending in support of uh, the committee. Uh, the second announcement I wanted to make uh, is that uh, the uh, Association of General Contractors, the San Diego chapter, has recognized for the second time in a row Caltrans District 11 as the best public owner of the region. And it's a very distinct honor because we competed against nearly 100 agencies, public agencies. And this award recognizes uh, the best agency for getting the best value for every construction dollar. It recognizes the, the agency staff for its professionalism in procurement and project administration and achieving the best value to the public. So it's an honor. Uh, and I want to thank everybody in Caltrans that works in putting together procurements and administering the contracts because, uh, like I said, it's a very competitive field and we're glad to be recognized for a second time in a row for this award. And the last announcement I wanted to make is that uh, Anne Fox, our planning director, has accepted uh, an interim appointment as the headquarters planning and model programs chief. Uh, so she's serving in Sacramento for, for the short term. And I'll be working on, on re, uh, replacing Anne and, and finding an interim replacement while she's acting in this capacity in headquarters. I know uh, Anne is my alternate for the Transportation Committee and for the Sandag Board, so it, uh, I'll make sure that I'll uh, share as soon as we find somebody to replace her. Thank you. Um, so, so, but this is your last month. You're in a countdown as well, aren't you? Uh, that is correct. December 22nd is my last day. Uh, so do we anticipate someone else coming for Sandag and then from? Uh, uh, yes, the director's and office will, still, is, will be here. Thank the you. director's office has advertised an interim opportunity for an acting district director, and they're reviewing applications right now. And an announcement will be coming by the end of the year. Thank you, thank you, Gustavo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilmember Duncan. Uh, good morning, Chair, uh, committee members, staff, and members of the public. I would like to take a moment to share some positive news regarding Sandag's Ride Fact Now program, which has been delivering on-demand wheelchair accessible vehicle service across our region since June. This new service showcases our community's innovative strides, providing long-needed service for individuals requiring wheelchair accessible vehicles. The program was recently recognized by the California Public Utilities Commission as the standout performer, unquote, poster child, unquote, of their Access for All program. I'd like to acknowledge the exemplary status of the program and thank our partners at FACT for their stellar implementation and invaluable leadership in providing this essential service to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Benson. 
Um, yes, thank you. So uh, thank you, Chair. And um, as Sandegg's representative to FACT, I'd like to echo Council Member Duncan's comments and add that recognition from the CPUC is a testament to the exceptional strides that our wheelchair accessible vehicle transportation services have taken under the partnership of Sandegg and FACT. And I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to FACT for their exceptional work and collaboration in delivering this crucial service. Thank you. Any other member comments? Seeing none, thank you all. Uh, let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, unless any members would like to uh, pull an item, are there any uh, public comments for consent? Thank you, Chair. We do have one public comment for consent. The original draw, you can go ahead. Yeah, I'm surprised that on the meetings for the last, uh, uh, or the minutes for the last meeting that it was written on there that I was speaking about a vaccine injury month and a support group. So kudos to whoever is taking the notes. Thank you for doing that because usually it's just very obscure. Anyway, um, as far as the um, accepting a grant funding for transportation network company access for all grants program, for $1,078,724, uh, um, you know, this is nice and all to provide a service for people in a wheelchair. I was handicapped for uh, in a wheelchair for eight years from being paralyzed. So um, I understand the need for it. But when I was mentioning um, something at the, um, the social equity working group, uh, Barry, uh, was trying to counteract what I was saying when I said that when you guys are putting people in um, the new type of vehicles that are electric and you're in a wheelchair and you have the possibility of not being able to get out if there's an accident, um, it, it puts people in danger. And I would be terrified to think that that, that vehicle could possibly blow up, whether you guys want to believe it or not, they can and they do, and they can't be put out. They even stay lit under what they'll go on in on fire underwater and won't go out. So, you know, as somebody who has been in that position before, those, uh, you know, wheelchair vans, depending on how the ramp goes out, um, it could either get stuck or never be able to come out because some of them come from underneath the van. They don't necessarily come up and uh, sit by the door. So, you know, you guys are putting people in danger by incentivizing to get all of these electric vehicles. Um, and if you're going to do that, then you need to make these people aware that they may be not be able to get out or that they need to be aware that, you know, they could be put into a position where they're going to have to figure out how to get out um, or they could blow up. It's just like a Prop 65 science, like enter at your own risk, but you need to take it seriously. Okay, we do have one additional member of the public who's raised their hand, if I could take that person as well. Uh, yes. Uh, Dan, you can go ahead when you're ready. Dan Schmihofsky, candidate for mayor of San Diego. I don't believe the pollsters. I believe in myself. Now, having trained in Borrego Springs in the heat, 115 degree heat, having trained in Acamba, Acamba Hot Springs, East County is getting a raw deal within the public policy of your organization. I'm aware of that. I'm going to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And I'm going to be honest. And if I can, cannot win the election by being honest and truthful, I do not want to win the election. That is who I am to the core. Thank you very much. That concludes the public comments. Thank you, Mr. Jessica. Do we have any um, questions or comments on the consent calendar? Well, members, if not, I entertain a motion to consider the consent calendar 
moved by Councilman Moreno and seconded by Mayor White. We can go ahead and vote. That motion passes unanimously with those members present. Great. Next up, we have uh, item number four. Um, Ken Smith will uh, present on the Transnet Environmental Mitigation Program for 2024-26 uh, uh, work plan and funding recommendations for the regional management and biological monitoring. Good morning, Chair Shu and members of the committee. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Kim Smith and I'm a senior to regional planner here at SANDAG, managing the Transnet Environmental Mitigation Program. Item number four on your agenda today is related to actions necessary to implement the Transnet EMP in fiscal years 24 through 26. Sorry about that. So um, I always like to include this slide just as a quick reminder, the Transnet EMP provides funding to mitigate habitat impacts from our regional and local transportation projects and funding for regional land management and biological monitoring. And it does this by acquiring and managing large tracts of lands with native habitat early in advance of our transportation projects that need mitigation. And this has allowed us to reduce overall cost, to accelerate the delivery of our transportation projects, including streamlining the permitting process, implementing our regional habitat um, conservation plans, and reducing the listing of species as threatened or endangered. I'm excited to say to date, the EMP has helped to acquire over 9,215 acres of land with our conservation partners. We are an award-winning program. We're recognized both nationally and by the state as a model for advanced mitigation, in addition to receiving several local planning awards for our best management practices. So today's item focuses specifically on the Regional Habitat Conservation Fund. This is funding for the regional land management and biological monitoring provisions of our EMP. Regional management and monitoring assures that the health and success of lands conserved as open space throughout our region are maintained. And this is very important because as San Diego County has the largest number of imperiled species of any county in the United States, some of which I've shown above. The EMP has also contributed over 46.5 million to the region to help with our management and monitoring of our open space. In addition, we have awarded a total of 136 land management grants since the inception of our program, totaling 18.8 million to local jurisdictions, organizations, and nonprofit. This funding helps our land managers deal with the impacts that threats, such as off-road vehicles, homeless, recreational use, illegal dumping, or invasive species have on our open space preserves, and also helps the implementation of projects and some of those you can see above, such as habitat restoration, we've got some dune restoration, um, signage and fencing, and invasive species removal activities that help to protect our biological resources. To implement the EMP, SANDAG, the SANDAG Board of Directors entered into an MOA with Caltrans, the United States Fish and Wildlife, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The, the MOA originally signed in 2008 and renewed in 2019 outlines that implementation strategy of the EMP. The MOA includes the allocation of 4 million annually to assist in funding the gaps in regional land management and biological monitoring in order to maintain our regional preserve system. It is a safety net that helps protect our transnet investments and helps eliminate the need for future listing of endangered species. SANDAG staff, with the assistance of the Regional Habitat Conservation Task Force, developed the work plan that identifies those key tasks and milestones. Per the MOA, annual funding for each fiscal year totaling $4 million is then reviewed and approved by the SANDAG board. So this year we're doing, normally we come to the committees and the board every year for the annual funding approval, but this year we're, we're doing something a little different. We're going to be allocating three years of funding for a total of 12, mil 12 million. The work is then implemented through our contracts and land management grants. 
So you might wonder, what is this work plan? The work plan implements the goals and objectives of the management tr strategic plan, which was developed in 2017. The MSP is a technical document that provides recommend recommendations for species. Priorities are based on species endangerment, habitat types, threats, and opportunities. It develops regional objectives for our efficient and effective use of regional management and monitoring funding. Staff worked with the Regional Habitat Conservation Task Force to take these technical recommendations from the MSP and develop them into the work plan for fiscal years 24 through 26. The work plan shown in attachment one of your report defines those goals and milestones proposed for completion in the next three years. The work plan also tracks and monitors those implementation actions in order for us to measure success. Attachment two, table one of your report depicts specific recommendations for the allocation of fiscal year 24 through 26 funding for regional management and monitoring split between the four strategic goals, promoting sensitive species, promoting native habit or vegetation communities, improving wildlife movement and promoting regional collaboration. And I'd like to now give you some examples of some of those key milestones SANDAG will be working on for each of those goals. For sensitive species, as you can see, the photo on the bottom left depicts the coastal California gnat catcher, which is the flagstone species for the development of our regional conservation plans. SANDAG will work with the United States Geological Service to complete regional surveys and a San Diego post-fire study that will inform the development of a connectivity assessment ranging from or spanning from the international border to Orange County and Riverside for this small but mighty bird. For native vegetation communities, you're probably wondering why I included a photo with cattle <laughs> on, in this presentation, but Sandig's going to continue to partner with UC Berkeley to evaluate the use of grazing as a large scale management tool to reduce fire risk, control invasive species and help with um, habitat restoration. We're going to be expanding our pilot grazing study to two new locations and finalizing a grazing management strategy based on those monitoring results. For wildlife movement, we're going to continue our important work um, with UC Davis and CDFW on testing predation deterrent devices with landowners and ramping up our education efforts, teaching those landowners how to better fence and protect their livestock to prevent future depredation events from occurring for the mountain lion. And finally, regional collaboration. I think this is what I'm most excited about with our regional partners, including a new collaboration with the San Diego Natural History Museum. SANDAG will be hosting a workshop in early next year to help in the development of a habitat conservation needs assessment. This needs assessment will identify gaps in conservation for the acquisition of open space and funding for regional management and monitoring. This will culminate with a final report and a presentation at the annual State of Biodiversity Symposium in April of 2024. Pending the board of directors approval, the proposed management and monitoring fiscal year 24-26 work plan would be implemented through 2026. Implementation would help eliminate future listing and promote the recovery of endangered species by providing land management and biological monitoring to proactively address the decline of endangered species and their habitat. Therefore, today, the Transportation Committee is asked to recommend that the Board of Directors approve the proposed fiscal year 24-26 work plan and budget allocation for regional management and biological monitoring. So thank you, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Kim. Let's go ahead with uh, public comments. Francesca, do we have any public comments on this item? Thank you, Chair, we have two public commenters. The original draw, you can go ahead when you're ready. Man, it's so hard to listen to your guys' propaganda. It was great having a break. Um, it's just ridiculous the way we talk about we're going to save the <laughs> the planet. We're going to take all this land. We're going to make sure that, you know, everything is good there. What are you guys doing, having any business doing that? And the funny thing is, is that people are endangered species right now. And so are all of the animals that people eat. <laughs> because eventually you guys are all going to have to be vegan. Are you okay with that? Okay, well, you just keep pushing this and we're on our way. Um, but you guys are talking about collecting rare plant seeds um, and doing genetic studies of things. So I don't know what the heck you think that you're doing, but you think you're going to preserve or, you know, um, restore anything. Because anything you guys <laughs> touch doesn't get restored or renewed or better. Um, you... <laughs> 
You're basically sitting here taking the land from the people, which is the plan of the UN. So, I mean, you guys are doing very good with that. But in reality, you don't understand what it's really about, I don't think. And so I don't know if you need to educate yourselves on Agenda 21 and what it is really about that has nothing to do with saving a planet or, you know, helping people. It's enslaving the people in depopulation. So, I mean, the more you guys push all these vaccines and stuff, you're totally in lockstep with people like Henry Kissinger. And thank God he's in hell right now. <laughs> like, I mean, so it's just funny to sit here and listen to you talk about, you know, wanting to do all these things when most of the time the land that gets this done is left and it goes to shit. It actually gets worse, <laughs> worse and uh, it doesn't get restored or maintained. Um and so, yeah, I mean, we're just going to be continuing to waste the people's money um, and taking, you know, land away from them that they can't use because it's like, oh, my gosh, we got to make sure the dunes are OK. You know, the earth takes care of itself. <laughs> the more we try and mitigate any kind of person's life or body or the earth, it's, it's destroying it. So good job. Uh, our next speaker is Dan. You can go ahead. Public comment ought to be respected despite the fact that personally I did not understand the last commenter but public comment ought to be respected now having mentioned that I'm speaking on behalf of my beloved Borrego Springs, Borrego Springs, and all my friends. And I want to thank you with all my heart for preserving that area of the world that is so unique, beautiful, tranquil. And I would hope I would hope that all of you are very sincere and genuine and true. And all of you work very hard and diligently to preserve the beautiful nature, the wildlife of not only Borrego's but Pine Valley and Hakamba Hot Springs and Julian and other areas of the East County, which are which are so valuable to us as humanity for future generations for 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. And I thank you. Uh, we do have one other speaker in the room, uh, Tim Bailash. If you'd like to step up to the podium, Tim will be our last speaker. Thank you for taking my comments, committee. Uh, my name is Timothy Bailash. I uh, must um, identify I am a candidate for Congress in the 50th District of California, but I speak today again as a public member. Um, I've become aware of the past turn. Uh, two years, I have a strong science background. And one thing I would urge Sandeg to include in your planning is to look at soil. I really wasn't aware of this until it was brought up about two years ago. Some of these regenerative farms, sustainable farming is an important component of, of climate change. And we do not know enough about the science. And one of the things we're finding out is that the transportation and building projects we have where we cover miles of concrete and asphalt are disrupting the soil, the soil that's not absorbing water. And these two issues are still scientifically not well understood. So whatever the transportation needs of the community and the building programs, I wanted to urge the planning for regenerative soil because the destruction of the underpinnings, the uh, particularly the fungal components, does not nourish plants. And the, so the water runs off into the ocean or you get sewage because of large amounts of runoff. But the other part of that is, is we're not absorbing the rainfall when it falls. 
So I would urge the committee to make sure that they include that in their plans for the coming time. And I thank you again. That concludes the public commenters. Thank you. Do we have any um, comments from members? Raphael. Thank you, Chair. Just um, thank you, Kim, for all of your work on this. You mentioned that the California Mac catcher is a cornerstone to the plan. Could you explain why that is? So early on in the 1990s, it was the, the species that was kind of the, the center of how when they developed the Natural Communities Conservation Program. So it was the species that they looked at to conserve because it also represented not only conserving that species, you know, the coastal sage scrub upland habitats, but also it incorporated those habitats incorporated other species along with it. So it was the kind of that flagstone species. Thank you. Any other member comments? If not, I'll make a quick quick uh, comment as if in the days that I was on the other side of the podium, I would have said that uh, medication is great and, and I'm glad we have um, this funding to do what we can to save species like the net catcher and, and others. Um, and I'm glad that we're moving forward on uh, alternative uh, forms of land management. Um, if not uh, uh, cattle, maybe goats to, to deal with the uh, um, uh, fire uh, threats. Uh, but I, my last comment would be just that uh, we should just keep in mind that mitigation is not good. Mitigation is something you do because you're doing something else that's harming the environment. So I think the real onus is, is on Sandag to do better planning so that we don't have to do as much mitigation. And this bit of mitigation is, of course, uh, important, vital, but we know that uh, in the overall picture, we're not doing well with regards to uh, treating our envi environment well. But uh, thank you very much. This is an item that um, has a rec recommendation for us to move forward to approve this plan. Do I have a motion? I'll move it again. So moved by Moreno and seconded by Edson. That motion passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll go on to item number five. Uh, Sam Stanford will give us a, uh, we'll get us started on a regional safety update. Good morning. Thank you, Chair and committee members for having us here today to provide this update on regional safety efforts uh, from Sandag. So my name is Sam Sanford. I'm a senior regional planner in Sandag's regional planning team, and I get to kick off this presentation that has multiple parts. But for this committee, you may recall that back in July of 2022, Transportation Committee, along with the Regional Planning Committee, made a recommendation to the Board of Directors that Sandag adopt a resolution on Vision Zero. And part of that resolution included direction to staff to develop a Vision Zero action plan, a traffic safety dashboard, and safety policies. So today we're able to provide updates on the Vision Zero action plan, the traffic safety dashboard, and a complementary plan that's safety related for the active transportation plan update. Uh, for the policies, those will follow the planning process. So the two planning efforts we'll speak to today, those are intimately tied and in, both of them are near-term implementation actions from the 2021 regional plan, but they're also key elements in advancing the safety goal that's been introduced for the 2025 regional plan. So achieving more together, you know, this slide really highlights how we can achieve more as a region unified on safety, regardless of the mode we choose. We need to identify those policies, programs, and uh, 
and projects uh, that align and support safety. The two planning efforts, the Regional Vision Zero Action Plan and the Active Transportation Plan are coordinated to help identify what projects, proje programs and policies can move forward to significantly advance safety. So these two efforts at their basic foundation support and utilize the same safety data and analysis. And then as far as engagement and receiving input from the public, they're also joined in that effort. So getting to the Vision Zero Action Plan itself, you know, this is, it is a comprehensive safety plan, ultimately in what, it, what it's achieving. And key to Vision Zero is that it's rejecting the idea that fatalities and serious injuries are some inevitable cost of using our public transportation infrastructure. It rejects that idea and sees those as preventable incidents. So where are we looking right now as far as uh, the state and our region? Now this, this slide will be grossly outshined later on when my colleagues Grace and Connor present on the traffic safety dashboard. But the point of this slide is to show that, you know, if we look at the top chart on statewide, statewide fatalities, over this past decade, we've seen an increase in the number of fatalities despite a lot of effort a lot of safety programs and, and projects going in, the trend is going the wrong way, not where we'd wanna see it. If we were to add on the more recently or the, the very recently finalized 2021 data, we'd see the same trend. If we added on 2022 data that's preliminary, that trend would continue. And unfortunately, our county is not exempt from this trend. So if we look at the bottom chart, we see that those bars are also generally increasing as we go across time. If we put a trend line on that, we would see the same. So what's our approach? First is, you know, with the direction of that resolution, staff was able to successfully secure funds from U.S. Department of Transportation and a grant called Safe Streets and Roads for All for a planning activity. And that's where we're getting the funds for the Vision Zero Action Plan. And on the regional side, we're looking at developing a plan that will then allow local agencies, cities, the county, and tribes to then apply for implementation or capital grants through that same funding source. But there's a requirement that the projects that are being applied for need to be listed in a qualifying plan. So the approach is to make it a regional plan that lists those projects that then jurisdictions and tribes can seek funding for. Parallel to that effort, we were able to join with the city of Vista and the La Jolla Band of Luiseno Indians who are also developing local specific safety plans where they're gonna be able to delve a little deeper into their safety solution recommendations. And those plans will be leveraged as examples and we'll develop templates from those plans that other cities or tribes, if they want to develop their own comprehensive safety plan, they'll have those templates. And I do wanna give a shout out to Caltrans for their tremendous support in this effort as well, not only in their expertise and their knowledge, but also supporting an in-kind match for this grant. So what do we get in a Vision Zero Action Plan? Well, first we'll be, you know, existing conditions. We need to know where crashes are occurring, what types of crashes, how frequently, what are the primary contributing factors to those crashes. So that'll be the first element and that's being undertaken right now. That will quickly advance into a high injury network. And I wanna pause on this one just for a second to show what a high injury network is. And this image on the right-hand side is from our, our planning neighbor to the north, the Southern California Association of Governments. They've done this in the past. And what they would found in their high injury network is that 65% of their fatal and serious injury cr crashes occurred on only 5.5% of their network. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about thousands of miles of roadway network. It's important to understand where we can focus our finite resources. And that's exactly what a high injury network does for us. We'll also get safety solution recommendations, also called countermeasures. This will be a menu of options for local jurisdictions or tribes to select from based on the context and their knowledge of the area of what will work. And also a prioritized list of projects, policies, and programs that can be implemented through the Safe Streets and Roads for All grants or other grant options as well. And then lastly, the aforementioned plan templates. 
So with that, I'll pass on to my colleague, Marissa. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marissa Mangan. I'm a planner here at Sandag in our mobility division, and I'll be giving you an introduction to the update of our regional active transportation plan that we've been really excited to kick off. This is a plan that we last adopted in 2010, so it's long overdue for an update. We've had several regional plan cycles occur. We've updated our transportation network, and we need to align our regional active transportation plan uh, with those other transportation planning investments. And we see a lot of active transportation planning opportunities uh, alongside that uh, update with regards to how people are choosing to travel, especially post-pandemic. There's a lot of opportunities with e-bikes, for example, and how people get around within their communities and connect to adjacent communities. Uh, and that's for moving both people and small goods. Since our last regional transportation plan was adopted, we included around 30 mobility hub areas. And the uh, areas uh, highlighted in pink on the map on the left show those locations, those neighborhoods. And we want to ensure that the regional bike plan connects all of those locations and aligns well with the uh, number of rapid transit, rapid bus uh, lines and investments that we're also making in our communities. We see the regional active transportation plan as a way in which to better connect our mobility hub areas and coincide with the great transit investments that we're seeing on our roads in the years to come. The map on the right shows some preliminary data that we've gotten from Replica showing high short trip end densities, trips that are under four miles. And they're real opportunities for us to think about how active transportation can facilitate a lot of those trips in our neighborhoods. The darker areas in purple uh, and red coincide nicely with the regional mobility hub areas depicted uh, on the left. And so we're looking at those locations in addition to a lot of regional destinations as opportunities to make sure our uh, bike way network uh, connects to those locations. The Regional Active Transportation Plan is essentially the guide for SANDAG in how we plan, design, and build bikeway projects, all in collaboration with all of you local cities. And we need to ensure that there's a, co a connected, direct, cohesive, comfortable, and most importantly, safe network uh, throughout the region. Um, I like to tout actually Caltrans as being our 20th jurisdiction, and so we need to kind of work all together as 19 jurisdictions plus Caltrans to ensure that all of those connections that are connecting cities and passing over uh, highway improvements do so safely. And so we're thinking about the network as facilitating some longer trips that could be more regional in nature, a few miles or more, uh, local trips, and also shorter uh, community connections. We're thinking also way beyond just the commute trip. Commutes are only accounting for about a third of our travel, and there's a lot of opportunities, weekends and evenings, social trips, et cetera, trips to the park that uh, can help inform how the network is shaped. And we can think about all of the local bikeway connections in all of your cities as feeding into a, a regional bikeway network at the same time. And when we're thinking about a regional bikeway network at major intersections, locations that overpass uh, or interface with Caltrans right of way, especially, we can think about also integrating pedestrian and safe walking improvements at the same time. Both the Vision Zero Action Plan and the update of the Regional Active Transportation Plan are coordinating very closely with all of our community engagement. Since both plans are happening at the same time, there's a lot of efficiency and it makes sense to do things together. So in addition to providing updates at working groups and policy advisory committees like this, uh, we're going to be having an online presence where we uh, engage with the community with interactive maps and surveys. We're doing a lot of in-person events all throughout the region, many of which are in coordination with our community based organizations. We're going to go real hard on social media and really engage uh, the, the community and giving us feedback that way as they're using Instagram and Facebook and all the other platforms. And we've put together a technical advisory group comprised of subject matter experts that we don't normally get to talk to. Uh, health academia, first responders, people that uh, aren't normally kind of providing input regarding safety and bikeway and walkway connections that we get a good uh, perspective on with regards to our data analysis and our outreach tactics. This is a preview of an online uh, interactive map that we have live right now at sandeg.org slash safer streets. We've had it open for just about two weeks and have already uh, reached nearly 1300 comments. People are really interested in providing input on safety concerns and safety improvements and uh, opportunities for improved bike and walkway connections. So it's really excited to see that participation. We encourage you all to get on and share with your jurisdictions as well. Equity is at the forefront of our community engagement program. 
We want to make sure that the strategy for community engagement is inclusive. Uh, we really want to reach people we're not normally talking to, and we really want to value lived experience, anecdotes and storytelling uh, as part of the uh, um, data collection that we're doing. So we're not just looking at quantitative data collection, but qualitative as well. Uh, and we want to make sure as we define the Regional Active Transportation Plan and take a look at what the high injury network is showing that we really prioritize underserved areas in the region for safety improvements and active transportation improvements. Here's a com combined high level uh, calendar uh, outlook for both plans and what we're accomplishing seat by season. Uh, the high injury network that Sam described is being developed now and will be complete uh, in terms of a draft by the winter time. We'll carry out additional data analysis for both plans throughout the winter so that by spring, there is a regional active transportation network that we can share with you all. By spring as well, Sam will have completed uh, the regional vision zero action plan uh, to make his deadline to USDOT and be eligible for uh, applying for grant funding in future cycles with USDOT. And we'll continue to hold uh, stakeholder outreach throughout 2024 as the regional active transportation plan continues to develop. I will hand it over to Grace to introduce the traffic safety dashboard. Good morning, committee members. My name is Grace Pino. I'm a principal research analyst here in the data science department. I just wanna give a quick background to the traffic safety dashboard. Um, back in 2018, the Transnet Triennial Audit had recommended that SANDAG begin to collect information on safety performance metrics in the region. And it's been a few years um, coming, but now we have developed the traffic safety dashboard. We had also announced this when Connor and I had come to the Transportation Committee a few months ago when we had presented the State of the Commute dashboard. Um, just a few things to note, the traffic safety dashboard was done in collaboration with all the jurisdictions. It was also, uh, Caltrans had also uh, provided their feedback and I believe our transit operators as well. We've also been collaborating across all all the different departments within SANDAG who have contributed to the development of this dashboard. And uh, just to also note that we are not the subject matter experts. Uh, the uh, I give that credit to all of our law enforcement. Specifically, um, this data comes from California Highway Patrols, and I'll let Connor spelled that out, Switter's, safety, Switter's data. And um, these are collisions um, that have happened where law enforcement has responded. So if a law enforcement agency has not responded to a collision or a fatality that was there, then that has, is not captured in this data. So I would like to um, pass this on to my colleague Connor who had developed the traffic safety dashboard. Thank you, Grace, and thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, introduce the traffic safety dashboard uh, here. So, um, as Grace mentioned, this was a project that spanned across all, the, uh, pretty much all departments at Sandag. We've also consulted with all the, uh, or given the opportunity to get select, uh, select feedback from our transit operators, from Caltrans, from uh, all of our uh, cities and the county as well. And so, uh, what you're going to be seeing here today is um, a dashboard that it lives in our open data portal. Um, it's going to include some Power BI uh, pages in it. It's also going to include some ArcGIS web maps. And uh, just for starters, uh, to address what Grace mentioned, this uh, data comes from collisions that are reported to law enforcement. So uh, one of the limiting factors here is that uh, if law enforcement doesn't respond to a collision, that's not going to be included in this report. So uh, minor fender benders that don't require law enforcement, that's not going to be included. And in addition to that, um, anything that happens on private property, that's not going to be included as well, as that's going to be uh, not included in these uh, reports. Reports. Um, in addition to that, uh, this data includes uh, collisions for uh, that were reported to law enforcement dating back to 2006 through uh, 2022, with the caveat that um, the CHP, they make this data set uh, considered final at uh, irregular intervals. And so at the moment, they recently made 2021 data finalized. And so we're in the process of processing that data right now. But um, what you're going to be viewing today um, has final data through 2020. Um, and we also do make 2021 and 2022 available, but there are just some uh, limitations that we have not gone and processed. 
Um, in addition to that, just uh, one quick uh, thing I wanted to mention here. Uh, SANDAG doesn't change uh, what's being reported here. We do some cleaning steps where we pretty much change coded values into labels, make things a little, spell out things, make things um, a little bit more digestible to the casual consumer, but um, we're not changing anything. One thing that we do um, uh, in, comp uh, in complement with our GIS team, um, they do a huge effort to take this data set and process and clean the location information that's associated with these collisions. And so that is one of the huge benefits of this is that this takes a publicly available data set and then makes it easy to use and accessible to anybody without needing a huge technical background. So that's one of the huge added values here. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and just kind of dive right in here um, and we'll kind of highlight one of the first things here. So this dashboard is kind of broken up into different topic sections. Um, first thing that we have here is an overview section where you're able to take this uh, first embedded Power BI figure and be able to query different data um, in this data set. And so um, if you go into this uh, Power BI page right here, what you're able to do is you see right on the top there, there's different filters that allow you to filter by date range, by area and a collision severity. Um, one thing that I'll mention here about collision severity is that these reports are labeled by the most severe collision severity. So for example, let's say that there's a fatal collision where one person unfortunately passed away due to the due to the collision, and then there is also three other individuals as a part of this that were uh, injured in this, that collision is going to be reported as fatal, um, even though there were also um, collisions or uh, victims in that uh, collision that also suffered injuries. Um, but yeah, so what you're able to do here is if you use any of these filters, what you're able to do is you're actually able to see on this page a couple of high level um, headline statistics there in the red, and you're able to see what uh, what the total number of collisions are based on the filters, the total number of injuries based on these filters, and the uh, total number of fatalities. And so this tool allows you to dive into this data in a way that you're able to get down specifically to the areas and concern of you, and then also um, learn a little bit more about these collisions. The table on the right here is showing you what the primary collision factor is. There may be a few different collision factors associated with a specific collision, but what this is uh, doing is it's uh, taking the information that the responding uh, officer on the scene is uh, determining as the primary collision factor. And this is listing out the number of fatalities by pedestrians, bicyclists, and total fatalities there. Um, this figure on the left here, it just has a trends uh, feature so that if you have multiple years selected, you're able to see a trend or a comparison between year to year. Um, so this really right here is kind of the the real essence here of what you're seeing that's going to be featured in the rest of this dashboard. If you hover over different features, it allows you to see certain statistics or information that's associated with any of this. But the, the great thing about this is that it's interactive. It allows people to use this in a way that is important to them and also things that can serve different needs without necessarily needing to have multiple people responding to lots of different requests. You have one single repository that you're able to go to. So moving on, we also have this fantastic product that our GIS team produced for us. This is a regional map where you're able to actually go in and view in a map where these collisions are happening. So as I mentioned before, the collisions that um, we've gone and geocoded, those are through 2020. So we do not have 2021 and 2022 just yet in this map. But what you're able to do here is you're able to view in the different areas of San Diego that you're concerned with the number of collisions that are happening. Right now, when you're looking at this map, a couple of things that jump out to you, these clusters here, these clusters are just a summary of the collisions that are happening in those region, regions. And as you dive in further and further, those clusters will disperse and get smaller and smaller as you get into lower geographies. You're also able Able to filter by collision severity here and also by jurisdiction. This map also features a couple of different layers where you're able to see the Calum virus screen um, uh, uh, impoverished communities and you're also able to see uh, the regional uh, active transportation network. So you're able to see things like the bike lanes and bikeways in the region. So if you hover over and uh, Kendall, I actually ask you to click on one of these clusters here. What you're able to do is you're able to see a couple of high level statistics here and it'll summarize the total number of uh, pedestrians that are injured and killed as well as bicyclists. Um, uh, when you click on these specific clusters, and then you can find similar information to this and more um, when you actually click on individual records. So these records, what I'm mentioning, they have all kinds of information in them. They have every different data point that a responding officer will take, whether there's alcohol involved, whether um, a tow truck was required to respond to the collision, how many people were injured, where it happened, what direction they were traveling. All of this information is available in this dashboard, and it has also been made available to download uh, at the bottom of this page. 
So uh, I'll go ahead and move on to the next section here. Um, we have a couple of topic uh, specific sections in this. We have a pedestrians and bicyclists section. So this is still pulling from the same data set, but what it's done is we've already gone ahead and queried um, specific collisions that involve pedestrians and bicyclists. And so if we scroll down here, you'll see that it's actually similar layout to the first Power BI embedded page, but it just dives in a little bit further. So as you get further and further into this dashboard, you're given more and more opportunities to uh, filter and query more specific information as these next topics are um, specific to individuals who may have an academic or planning need for this, because that was the goal of this project is to be able to provide something to your typical average consumer of uh, data. So someone who's maybe just curious about what's going on in their neighborhood, as well as regional uh, planners, uh, not only at Sandag, but across the entire region. Um, so here, what you're seeing here is that you have a couple of different filters in this page as well, collision severity, area, date range. Um, we have a map here as well, in addition to the high level headline numbers, we have a trends page that shows you trends over years. And then uh, we also have a primary collision factor table and the pedestrian action, which is showing what the pedestrian was uh, doing prior to the collision here. Um, and then we also have an uh, arrow in the top right corner for a uh, similar page, but this one, this topic is for uh, bicyclists. So, um, Moving on, um, I'm not going to spend all the time diving into every single topic here. These are all very similar and you can really uh, query to your heart's content uh, here. Um, but one thing that I will mention as we go down, we have a demographics page here, which uh, gives you information related to the uh, different parties and victims who are involved in these collisions. So individuals who are involved and as well as victims of these different collisions. Uh, the next section, uh, if we go ahead and scroll down, is going to have information related to transit and rail. This actually comes from a different source. This doesn't come from the statewide integrated uh, traffic reporting system, also known as SWITERS. This comes from the Federal uh, Transit Administration. Administration. And so this data has two pages. This is one for transit, and then we have one for rail. And so uh, similar layout, similar visual, but just a different data source. Um, and then lastly, like I mentioned, we do have a kind of how to use this dashboard for people who need a little bit of help kind of figuring out how to navigate through all of this. And we also have quick links to um, the location where you're able to access not only the data itself, but also the metadata associated with it. So you can find a standardized way of viewing what is included and some of the details about what was done to this data while we were uh, producing it. Um, lastly, before I close here, I just wanted to mention as well that um, we do have some next steps as a part of this process. One of the great benefits of this project is that it is very versatile. And so as we receive feedback, we're definitely looking forward to making this a lot more uh, usable for different consumers. So as we receive information, we are looking to make updates. Uh, some of the feedback that we've gotten already on this is that it'd be great to have bookmarked views. So being able to have a button that someone can click on that says, oh, show me this area, show me uh, this topic. And so that way you can click a button and it already navigates for you so that you don't have to do that. Um, we're also looking to add some deeper analysis to this, so including uh, some per capita uh, statistics as well as normalizing for VMT. We are also looking to add more topic sections that will be able to provide uh, another angle to be able to view um, the safety on our uh, local streets and roads. Um, and so I want to thank everybody again for your time, and I will now go ahead and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you. Let's go to public comments. Uh, Francesca, do we have any public comments? Thank you, Chair. We do have one public comment in the room and two on Zoom. Uh, Timothy Bailash, if you'd like to go ahead, and then we will go to Dan on Zoom. Good morning, committee. Timothy Bailash, again, speaking as a public member. Wow. All I can say is wow. Um, I love the detail. Um, I'm going to be ordering a couple of pizzas tonight and staying up late, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I love the numbers and uh, the drilled in too, but uh, not but, but and I would ask if there was some way to include some kind of rates because it's hard to get a, an idea of the density of crossings at intersections, vehicle travel and things like that. So you have absolute numbers. That's the best thing to have. And this is a fantastic way to show it. Um, but things like maybe per vehicle uh, transit, per pedestrian transit, street crossings. Uh, I'd also be interested in kind of time periods. So when was this happening and uh, the rate for those kind of things, and also some idea of population densities. Is this happening in rural areas on, on, uh, on lonely roads without any improvements or at intersections? Thanks again. 
Our next speaker will be Dan, followed by the original draw. Dan Schmihovsky, candidate for mayor of San Diego. Anyone supporting the Gloria regime is complicit, complicit in failure. Now, I don't mean to be rude or angry, but remember, I've done one million miles on foot and on bike on three continents. In Normandy, I never heard of this happening in France. I never heard of any group like this. Avenue Fush, one of the widest boulevards in Europe. On my last visit, there was a lady, I watched her. She was just about to cross the street, the widest boulevard, one of them in Europe. Every car came to a screeching halt. This is a societal, national problem. And the solution, the solution is going to shock you. It will shock you. And you will think I'm crazy. We need to build a state-of-the-art psychiatric hospital in San Diego. We need traffic enforcement, special traffic enforcement in every neighborhood. And we need to recruit traffic enforcement additional in every neighborhood 24 hours a day where they're keeping watch. Thank you, your time has expired. Our next speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead. Keep in watch, they're always keeping watch. Um, Yeah, I just find it interesting that you guys are saying we're rejecting fatalities are part of the plan, even, even though there's an increase in fatality. It's just so funny. Um, you're never going to stop all fatalities. You understand that, right? You're never going to go to vision zero. It's just funny because like, you know, lies are dependent upon people believing in them, but the truth isn't. The truth just stands alone. And so you guys got to continue the lies so that people continue to believe it. But it's just really sad because, you know, all of this, I would seem to be that you're going to be using it to demonize driving what you're doing. And we have people like Jack who talk about like, I'm just going to cross the street and the cars just need to stop for me. I mean, maybe you should go to Europe where they will do that. I mean, I don't know. But it's like, you know, do you take that into consideration that someone is almost like attempting suicide and just hoping that the person stops in the vehicle? I mean, but then we're demonizing driving and acting like we need to get everybody out of it. And you guys talk about equity and you want to put all these bike, you know, infrastructure up and all these projects. Are you also going to get people bikes? Does everybody have a bike? You know, are you just going to be like, well, otherwise, otherwise you just got to walk, you know, I mean, because we're we're getting rid of the driving. I mean, that's coming down the pipe. And you guys talk about how people choose to travel. You're not giving them all the choices that they have. You're actually dictating what their choices are by incentivizing or de-incentivizing this new way of living. And you talk about safety all the time. It's just it's funny because it's like what you got people in, on this board that just want to cross the street and think people just need to stop. And you guys act like you're God, like you can sit here and mitigate all of these things. And like, you're ever going to stop deaths from happening. I've been hit head on by a drunk driver who was also high on PCP. To me, that doesn't mean that, oh, we need to get rid of driving. That's not what it is about. Like you guys want to take things that happen and then demonize it so you can get rid of it. That's what people need to see. This is a part of the UN agenda, period. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Do we have any member comments or questions? Councilman Zito. Hey, thanks for the presentation and thanks for the uh, the infrastructure that's been put up there. I, I haven't had much time, but I have played with that portal a little bit and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I will note just the one comment. I mean, the one thing that, and again, 
knowing that I haven't played with it much, but the one thing that uh, I would find useful being easier to to drag out from the metrics would be some indication of potentially at fault. So I can see how many accidents have occurred, but when there's an accident between a car and a bike and between a bike and a ped, who, you know, how many of those was the automobile at fault or the bike cyclist with, at fault? When you do a, when you do the summary and say, oh, you know, you have so many cyclist accidents and it involved uh, driving or bicycling under the influence was what, well, was that a car that hit the cyclist or the car was DUI or was a drunk cyclist just right, right off a cliff and it's 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 a little bit difficult to dig a little bit of that out i'm sure it's possible but i just haven't haven't seen it yet um the other c comment around the vision zero stuff um the Probably this is already hope, happening, but I'm hoping we're collecting information and coming up with strategies to deal with uh, active and extensive construction zones and what the what the strategies are there. Uh, for example, I've you know over the past year, as I bike uh, here and go down Friars Road, there's some major project going on there. Not sure what it is, but that changes every three weeks as to what is going on and how a cyclist may or may not be accommodated. Sometimes it's decent, sometimes it's not existent. And uh, and, it, and so I have to adapt myself every single time to a new condition and try to ascertain what's the safest way to get through that space. And I think we're all aware of, you know, I, I always find it ironic is either a pedestrian or is a cyclist when, when a road sign, a construction sign comes up and say there's construction ahead, it's always placed either in the pedestrian or the cyclist area. It's like, well, you're, you're warning drivers, put it in the driving area or something like that. But maybe there's a way that we can um, accommodate uh, making sure everybody's aware of what's coming up from a hazard perspective um, and uh, yet not actually make it more hazardous for these other modes of transportation by doing so. But um, great information, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Musgrove. Yes, thank you. Great presentation. So uh, Switters identifies the parties by number and identifies the PCF to the party, and there could be a contributory factor. Could you extrapolate the data from the PCF to assign to the party to make it easier than to determine who was considered primarily at fault from the existing data? Yes, and uh, kind of related to the question uh, earlier, you, there is a way in uh, looking at the, depending on what the topic is that you're concerned with, whether it be pedestrian or bicyclist, um, you can determine who the party is at fault uh, using the dashboard. Um, I think we can definitely make it a little bit easier to make it more intuitive and provide some directions if that is definitely a, a topic that could be of interest to people using this dashboard moving forward. Um, but yeah, you were definitely able to see who is at fault and which party is at fault in um, any type of collision using this Switters data. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, speed would generally indicate the car, not the pedestrian. But if it's movement on a roadway, that could be indicative of either party. So it would be very helpful to link one to the other. Thanks. Councilman Duncan. Thank you. If we have uh, follow-up questions, is there um, one of you prefer that we reach out to? Since I guess you did this presentation on this part, Connor, would it be you we reach out to okay? Yeah, absolutely. Any of us, we'd be able to happy to answer your questions. Anything right. related to the dashboard, I could definitely answer any of those. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, no Thank you, Chair Shu. I want to thank you all for all of this work because it is uh, very important and it's going to save lives, which is um, un unfortunate that we're losing 12 people every day on California roadways throughout the state uh, due to um, collisions. A, a couple of uh, things that I wanted to point out is uh, you mentioned the active transportation program as a as a great opportunity to look at improving the network for bicyclists, and it is. Uh, and and uh, you also mentioned that that is also an opportunity to look at pedestrians uh, at, at those locations. Uh, given that the number of pedestrian fatalities is much greater than the bicyclist fatalities. I think there should also be an emphasis on on what else can be done beyond the active transportation program to reduce the number of pedestrian fatalities because they may intersect in some locations, but in a, in a lot of locations, the pet fatalities do not intersect with any plans to improve the active transportation network for bicyclists. So I, I think that uh, you're right that we all need to look at this. All 20 jurisdictions need to look at this to see how we can make a difference. But when it comes to our most vulnerable users, we need to look at bikes and pets 
together, but also separately and see where we can reduce the numbers for both. Uh, with, with respect to, um, uh, to, to the uh, looking at the data with respect to per capita or per, per miles traveled, uh, at least the data that I have seen statewide indicates, of course, that the no largest number of numbers are in the urban areas, right? If you look at the whole state, Los Angeles, for sure, is where most fatalities happen. But when you when you compare the data with with uh, with travel and per capita, it's actually the rural areas where uh, the highest incidence of, of uh, fatalities and serious injuries happen. So I'll be curious to look at that uh, data as well for our region. And I'm suspecting that is a similar trend. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we need to look at engineering to, to reduce the number of fatalities and serious injuries, but engineering alone is not gonna work. Uh, we recently read in the media an incident where some lives were lost for in a, in a vehicle where people were not uh, wearing seat belts. And education is very important. At this day and age, nobody should die because they're not wearing a seatbelt. Uh, the impacts of uh, distracted or impaired driving. Uh, so, so there's got to be a, a strong component of this that focuses on education in addition to uh, things that we can improve to make the system more uh, forgiving. Thank you. Any other member comments, questions? If if not, I have a, a few quick questions. Um, I, I think some of this data, at least I've heard of it uh, before, and these community organizations have actually made comparisons between their number of accidents uh, compared to other communities, and they they found huge differences w within our region. Um, so with that in mind, I'm glad we have a, a dashboard now. We can access that information much easier and. and and uh, have even more information on our hands. How is this information getting to our public works directors and city planners? Uh, and I mentioned that because I had to get a, a source from the San Diego Bike Coalition to advise my public works director that he might want to work in some of this data to a, a bike plan. So initially, as Connor and Grace mentioned, we reached out to the local jurisdictions and staff to find out like what information, how best to incorporate that. Now that the dashboard is launched and it's been three weeks, it's very new. Uh, we've started in integrating the site location and the QR code that you just saw on the slide deck into other outreach materials. So as there's press releases and other materials going out, that's one way it's going to be disseminated most publicly, but we also want to reach out through our working groups and start sharing this information through announcements um, and other, as we come back to them and provide updates on the planning efforts, we'll continue to provide updates on the dashboard as well so they get that information. Great. And my other question is, uh, you know, as we address equity and there may be some future funding uh, coming for helping uh, these safety issues, is there a way that we can at least make this accessible so that we can use it for funding criteria? Uh, that is, we can identify those areas that are most in need. Um, and I'm aware of um, uh, what was just pointed out in rural areas may have a very high per capita rate, but actually in national numbers, it may be, it may be low, but we have other uh, concerns with regards to equity in certain communities having much more uh, higher numbers of, of traffic accidents and deaths. Is there a thought of how that would be, this will be integrated into funding criteria? So in the Vision Zero Action Plan and that existing conditions assessment, that will include an analysis to understand how crashes, uh, at least at national level, we already know that crashes disproportionately affect uh, low-income minority communities. We're doing the same analysis or similar analysis for our region to, to assess that. With the dashboard being up and running and the work ongoing with analysis, we're going to be in a much better position for grant funds uh, now that we have a system up in place that we can use to query and pull the data for grant applications um, should another opportunity arise. Great. I, I kind of hope that was like a yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is a informational item. So without any questions or comments from the board, um, board members, uh, thank you, Sam, Marissa, Grace, Connor, uh, for, for giving us a great uh, report. Uh, let's go on to the next item, which is um, item six, and with Cindy and Antoinette, who will be making a presentation on the findings of the 
2023 telework in San Diego region study. Thank you, Chair. This is actually primarily Dr. Burke's presentation, but I'm just going to kick it off because doing this survey really is a collaboration between our regional planning department and the data science team. So you've heard us say many times that developing the regional plan is a data-driven process. It's one of the requirements we have using current data, current planning assumptions. So when we kick off the comprehensive update of the plan, we start by doing a significant data collection effort, analysis effort, and today you're going to hear about um, one of those critical data sources that we use to inform the, the regional plan. And this is a relatively new survey. It's something we started back in 2021. We've, for many years, made assumptions in the regional plan about telework. We've always assumed that people who work from home generally drive much less, so we take credit for it as a VMT and GHG reduction strategy. But as I think we've seen through the pandemic, um, that may not necessarily be the case. In fact, people are making more discretionary trips, trips that they would have possibly combined with commute trips. So on the way to work, stopping at the grocery store, dropping the kids off at school, and now maybe those are becoming more discreet trips. So in the spring of 2021, as um, we were coming out of the pandemic, um, we uh, conducted this survey just to understand what employers' plans were for telework in the future. Would we see higher levels of it than we had in the past now that everybody had gotten adjusted to it and had the technology that they needed? Um, and we repeated that survey just recently as we started to update the 2025 plan. Um, and the, the um, data is really interesting. Um, this is also something that CARB has asked us to do. CARB said, you know, you've made a lot of assumptions about telework in your plan. Things have changed, where people work, how they work, when they work. So we'd like to see you collect localized data um, to validate in the assumptions that you're making in your regional plan. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Burke, um, and she'll share the, the um, outcomes of the, the survey and some of the implications and things that we're considering as we're putting the plan together. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. As Antoinette mentioned, um, we definitely want to make data-driven decisions, and this is just one of the surveys that we have done. Um, in our 2021 regional plan, our base year was 2016, and for our 2025 plan, it's going to be 2022, and we all know how many things have changed since 2016. So we did do this survey for the first time in 2021, and our 2023 survey is, again, of businesses as well as employees, and it's a different sample. We didn't do a longitudinal study. Um, whenever you're doing surveys, um, we obviously have to take a sample. So we talked to 627 businesses and 1,100 employees. Um, we worked with True North Research to do the most um, valid and reliable sampling that we possibly could. Um, we have a lot about the methodology in the full report, which is online, and the um, level of error that might be a, a about 3%, 3.9 for the businesses of plus or minus with any of the data that we're presenting, obviously. But the data are weighted to represent the size of the businesses, the locations around the county, um, as well as the industry type. So um, we all know um, that telework has really changed. During the pandemic, We it was really coupled with all the um, emotional stressors of socially isolating, homeschooling for children. Um, and it was really mandated. We know that about one in three businesses overall in the region are something that could be worked remotely. And when we did the survey in 2021, businesses were still not sure about it. They um, were very nervous about um, being able to manage poor performers, um, the level of communication and collaboration. We know that more junior staff who are trying to develop relationships might um, have been uh, affected more negatively. But we found in this 2023 survey for the businesses that 46% felt better about remote work than they used to. And they're acknowledging that it can have a positive impact on staff morale. About two thirds said that they thought it did lower business ex expenses, as well as the ability to hire and retain good employees, including those who may live outside the region or further away. And we also found that almost half said that they had actually reduced square footage or terminated leases, which obviously has impacts for both the business community as well as we look at how land use decisions are being made in our jurisdictions. Challenges still remain, though, um, about how do you ensure um, good communication and coordination and, again, um, the ability to identify possibly people who may not be as productive if they're not in the office setting. So for the data, um, the bars here show for all of the businesses we talked to, the percent of that offered remote work. So you can see prior to the pandemic in 2021, that was the same sample we talked to. Um, 
it went from about two thirds, 64 to 68. Now in 2023, we had 72% of businesses in the San Diego region offer um, remote work to at least one employee at least one day per week. So that has increased, but you could see even more has gone up at the percent of, um, I'm sorry, yeah, 27 uh, to 57%. I got those mixed up. Um, and the percent of employees has increased from 64 to 68 to 72%. So prior to the pandemic, only about one in four businesses offered remote work. Um, and now we have 57% of businesses. But there's some interesting differences because most businesses, the most publicized ones that we may hear about are large businesses, 50 or more employees. But actually about two thirds of businesses in San Diego County are, have actually less than five employees. And so we found some interesting differences between small businesses and large businesses. And you can see that small businesses, um, the first bar on the left, are actually less likely to offer remote work um, compared to big businesses. But then when they do offer remote work, they're more likely to be able to offer it to a greater percentage of their employees due to the nature of the work. So if you think of at a place like Qualcomm, for instance, there um, are a greater variety of different types of um, jobs that people may have to perform. When we looked at the change from um, being able to offer it to the same percentage of employees, more employees or fewer employees, it's a similar story. You can see that actually compared to um, uh, in the past, larger businesses are saying they're offering it to fewer employees than they did during the pandemic. And um, smaller businesses are actually saying they're offering it to more 30% compared to only 1% of the larger businesses. Some other stats to consider when we think about what does remote work look like nowadays. Bless you. Um, we know that um, employees are um, coming from outside the region, that some businesses, a small percent are um, about one in four saying that they did allow employees to move away during the pandemic or that they've hired employees um, outside the region. But at the same time, we know that the 100% remote is very rare. Only about one in um, 10 employees said that they worked remote 100% of the time. 60% of all the businesses in the region say that they don't have any of their employees 100% remote. Of the businesses that say that they have remote work at all, 83% um, say no one is 100% remote. So we have much more of a hybrid situation. On average, employees are, um, are telling us that they're coming in, that they work remotely about three days per week. And most of those employees do have flexibility on the days that they're going into the office. Um, some, like Sandag, have mandated days that they, they do it. Um, but we also found that businesses are saying that not having the most flexibility in their remote policy is having some effect, especially larger businesses, on um, hiring and retaining employees who may have really gotten used to remote work and want greater flexibility than the business may be giving them. So turning to our employee survey, it's a, it's a similar uh, data story. Um, again, the bars show the percent that said that they telework, and you could see that prior to the pandemic, only one in four employees said that they could ever telework again one day per week. Um, it went up to 54%, but back down actually now for 39%. And this shows the average number of days per week that they work remote of all employees overall. So while we thought that if for those who had to drive a commute in the morning or the afternoon and, and knew that traffic volumes went down, again, there's a greater variability as people are returning to the office and on different days of the week. Looking at the employment sector, so some interesting things to highlight. Um, the first finding is employees that were most likely to work prior to the pandemic remotely were still most likely to do so afterwards. Those in the finance industry, real estate, and professional services. So the percentages there show what percent of individuals in those industries said that they were able to work remotely pre-pandemic in 2021 and 2023. Those who um, were least likely to work remote pre-pandemic um, administrative, public administration, you could see how small those percentages were prior um, to the pandemic, 13%. They're still higher now, but still one of the lower ones, about um, one in three. And then employees in the sectors that had the greatest change in the ability to work um, remotely, um, transportation and education. We know teachers who are working remotely and are now back in the classroom. You can see that went up to, for example, 24% to 76%, but back down to 26%. Um, this data shows um, uh, the ability to telework by the business type, and obviously we know that retail is much more likely to have to be on site, hotel accommodations, um, for example, too. So this shows that on average about one in three of the uh, jobs are being able to be teleworked, and it's 40% uh, higher um, 
is the highest in Coronado. Lemon Grove um, has the lowest at 22 percent. Um, we also do analysis by employment centers to, again, understand where um, our largest downtown, um, Sorrento Valley, as well as Kearney Mesa, are our largest employment centers around the region. Um, the dark blue parts of this map show where some of the higher abilities to telework are, to telework propensities. And the yellow shows you along, um, for example, the 78 corridor um, and some other areas in green where we have some of the lower uh, telework propensities. Um, it was interesting, actually, um, the ability to work in Kearney Mesa has a lower telework where we have a lot of government workers compared to Sorrento Valley where there might be a little bit more discretion. Um, another important, th important thing to think consider when we're uh, looking at the region and, and uh, telework assumptions is there's disparities over who can work remotely. We know that younger individuals are the least likely to say that they can work um, from home at least again one day per week um, compared to individuals who are 45 to 54. Household income was a significant predictor with only 22% of those who make between 24,000 and um, under 50,000 compared to those who have household incomes of 150,000 or more. We see disparities in ethnicity race, um, as well as resident location. Those um, who employees who said they lived in South County were less likely to say that they could work remotely than compared to those in North County West. And then finally, um, some other stats. Um, Antoinette mentioned this, that just because somebody's not driving to work doesn't mean that they're still not um, contributing to our vehicle miles traveled around the region. We know from the survey that about four and five employees who telework take midday trips, and that could be trips that would have been taken place on a weekend, but it also could have been something that they combined with their tour to work that they're not doing now. Um, so that was about 82%. And we know that the average miles that they drive is about nine. The average commute round trip is about 20 miles. So they're still contributing about half of what they would have done otherwise. Um, we also know that employees who um, telework are now more likely to drive solo to work compared to those who don't work flexibly, maybe because the um, ability to carpool with somebody varies if they're choosing what days they go into work. And then this goes across the teleworking. We know that more individuals are buying things online, getting those delivered, as well as still driving for errands. So um, my example is, you know, I know I ordered a couple of things from Amazon, but I still need to go to Target or Walmart to pick something else up. And then I'm also driving to return the things from Amazon um, that I decided not to keep. So we have a lot of uh, light vehicles delivering packages as well, people still doing their errands on the road. So telework has not fixed everything. Um, remote work, our takeaways is, is it's more common than it once was, but the percent of employees who are teleworking 100% of the time has declined. Um, the days that people telecommute are varying, suggesting variable uh, travel at highway hotspots around the region. Um, larger businesses are less likely to be able to offer remote work to all of its employees. So again, it's important that we continue to look at our um, travel to and from our employment centers. Um, not everyone is able to work remotely, um, so ensuring transportation options for disadvantaged groups is essential, and individuals who work remotely still take those single occupancy trips, so it's important for us to consider all the, the things in our toolboxes. We're trying to look at how can we reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled for um, our environment and our community. So I'll turn it back over to our, our chair and Antoinette to see if she has anything else she'd like to add. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I think just from a planning perspective, um, this really uh, emphasizes for us that commuting is still happening, that even though people are teleworking, they're not necessarily doing so every day of the week. So we need to continue to invest in our major commute corridors and we need to continue to provide travel options for commutes. Um, but there's a lot of short trip making that's happening as well. So um, we also need to have options for those short trips, whether it's flexible fleets or safe bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, we have a lot of people um, in moving around in their neighborhoods and needing those options as well. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand it back to our chair for questions and comments. Thank you, Francesca, do we have any public comments? Thank you, we do have one public comment, the original draw, you can go ahead. You guys are funny, it's like watching a comedy show, it's great. Um, <laughs> You know, and the thing is, is that it's never really about the problem, but the solution that's being implemented, that's what you always have to look at, right? Like, what's the solution that, and why are they implementing it? Uh, it's just you guys demonize driving so much. Teleworking hasn't fixed everything. Oh, my gosh. And it's like, talk about live where you work, right? Because it's like you're talking about doing that where it's like we want everything to be real dense. Well, I mean, if you have everybody, you know, teleworking, I mean, who cares where anybody lives, right? Then you don't have to do your density plan, right? 
but it's just funny to hear you talk like we have to reduce solo trips these people are just killing our planet to drive alone and it is the most dangerous right jack i mean good thing we're telling people this because oh, and you just love to use data that's the funny thing is like all the data you collect is set up to go against those the people and it's like i don't know why you thought that everybody's going to want to go and do teleworking and that they're just going to all be at their homes and never need to go out. I mean, I can't believe that they need to go run errands. I mean, that's crazy to think that teleworking didn't do it. What are we going to do? Does that mean we're going to implement this in the 2025 plan and kind of, you know, incentivize that kind of stuff? I mean, because we got to get people out of their cars, right? And what a good thing is, is that we have that new kill switch that's coming out, right? And it also has sensors. So, I mean, if, you know, they can just shut the car and then you can just be like, you know what? We don't want them leaving after they're done teleworking. They just need to stay at home, right? And then we'll have a robot come and deliver them stuff because this is going to save the planet, you guys. I'm telling you, you guys are so... <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's hilarious the way that you guys believe all of this stuff um, and that you're like, younger people are less likely to be engaging in this. Well, what are we going to do to them? We need to target them next. We need to be targeting a lot of these people so that they do what we want, right? I mean, gosh, nobody is listening. It's crazy. That concludes the public comments on this item. Thank you. Do we have any member comments, Councilman Edson? Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Burke, for the presentation. Uh, as we heard, 60% of all businesses do not offer full-time remote work, and fewer employees report working remotely now than in 2021. While commuting patterns have changed, lower-income workers are more likely to still commute to work. Ensuring the region has adequate transportation options for all types of workers is integral to meeting vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas reduction goals. Thanks. Councilman Moreno? Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, I think that these results uh, must be incorporated into the assumptions behind our regional plan. Uh, the regional variation in remote work, I think, is particularly striking. Uh, people living in richer areas in the northern part of the county are more likely to have the opportunity to work remotely than people living in poorer areas in the southern part of the county. Um, as we saw with the effect of work from home policies during the pandemic, losing just a percentage of commuters at peak times can drastically reduce the congestion um, on roads and freeways. Uh, so I imagine that people who are allowed to work remotely probably have a little bit more control over the timing of their commute um, about when they get to office, uh, to their office. So I think um, this makes it more difficult for transit to compete with uh, driving for commuters who are able to remote work as a, they're always going to have the option of delaying their commute times to beat traffic. So the conclusion that I draw in is that uh, transportation projects that serve South County or workers and industries that cannot work remotely should be prioritized in our regional plan because these investments offer a greater return on investments. Um, but thank you again for the report. I look forward to seeing the results incorporated into our plan and into um, the prioritization of our capital improvement projects. That concludes my comments, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from any of the board members? Um, thank you, this is really good information. I, I remember when the pandemic hit that uh, we thought telecommuting was gonna be a, uh, a magic bullet to some degree to reduce EMT, um, which it did to some degree, and, and now we have more information. Uh, so. One of the things, Dr. Burke, that was interesting to me is is uh, whether or not telecommuting may be reducing the demand during um, the the rush hour, the, the periods. Uh, so even though VMT may not have gone down as much because people are, are traveling um, for other reasons, even though the telecommuting, uh, do we have a, a good idea how much it may have reduced um, demand during uh, periods of congestion? 
Um, so uh, our last presenters talked about the open data portal and our state of the commute um, is a report that Grace and her team um, work on where we look at commute times. Um, and we can see from that as well as our highway tracker data that's also on the open data portal that the average commute times in the mornings are slightly shorter for most hot spots than they are in the afternoon where more people might be out and about. So I think there is that flexibility in, in when people are doing it and, and when we're seeing it. So I think it's that definitely reflects some of the change. And just as a follow-up uh, question from Customer Moreno's point, um, if telecommuting is more um, able to be done by certain populations, certain communities, how is that going to affect our regional plan with regards to future needs and, and um, how to address uh, transportation needs, given the different kinds of uh, transportation uh, demands? Uh, by, by population and that you also brought up by uh, ethnicity. I, I think I sort of addressed this in the closing comments, Chair, but it really, I think, made it clear for us that our commute corridors remain important. We need to continue to have options um, to our job centers along those major commute corridors, um, as well as um, serving these short trips. So those are some of the key takeaways for the planners who have been working on the initial concept for the regional plan. Great, thank you. And and for my um, fellow council member Duncan from uh, Coronado, if we get the military to be able to telecommute, uh, you'll have a lot less problems in Coronado. I don't think that'll work that well for the SEAL training base. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, this was the informational item, so we're gonna have to take an action. Thank you very much, Cindy. Let's move on to um, the next item, which is uh, lastly, number seven, we have uh, Jeff and Natasha will be uh, making a presentation on regional medium, uh, regional medium and heavy duty uh, zero emission uh, vehicles. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members of the board, or excuse me, the committee. Um, my name is Jeff Oyos. I'm a senior planner here at Sandag. I work on the planning department, and I'm here to provide uh, an update on the regional medium duty, heavy duty zero emission vehicle blueprint. This should be familiar to you all. I br brought it a few times this year, and this is the final. Uh, accumulation of the work that we've done. So I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about the blueprint and, and the implications it has for the region. Um, the blueprint is a California Energy Commission funded grant. It's a $200,000 grant to do it within about two years to develop a regional blueprint that will help guide the region's transition of trucks and buses to zero emission. Um, and really looking at the, the challenges and the barriers as well as some strategies to overcome those barriers and challenges. Um, the, there are a number of uh, deliverables that feed into this final blueprint, including a needs assessment, a siting criteria, and implementation strategies um, and that I most recently brought to you all in June. This blueprint uh, is a, so perhaps there's animation there. This blueprint uh, was put together with Sandag, the Port of San Diego, uh, Fair and Peers ICF, and the Environmental Health Coalition. And we, we, we've been doing community outreach and engagement, getting feedback throughout the process. So we're looking forward to sharing this, uh, some of this summary, and then talking, as I mentioned, about uh, some of the next steps here. This is an outline of the blueprint. It's, it's available online currently. We're looking for feedback through the 15th of December, and we're looking to wrap up in the month of January next year. This outline follows similarly to those deliverables that I mentioned earlier, highlighting the need to shift to zero emission trucks and buses, why we're doing it, uh, the infrastructure that's associated for that, for those vehicles that are coming, um, and then the, the proper infrastructure siting, the importance of that, being able to look at how we can best uh, make a foundation of siting infrastructure here in the region, talk about some of the challenges and, and barriers, as well as those innovations and strategies we can, we can use to address those challenges, and then looking ahead, how we're, how we're thinking about using this blueprint. So uh, the, the North Star, so to speak, is Governor uh, Newsom's Executive Order 7920, which is looking at zero emission trucks, buses, and light duty vehicles here in the state of California. The Advanced Clean Fleet Regulation and the Advanced Clean Truck Rule, as well as the Innovative Clean, clean Transit Rule, also complement that and really set the, the regulations and, and the policy around how we're going to get there. Uh, for trucks and buses, we're really looking at 2045 as the, the, the horizon year for zero emission trucks and buses. 2035 is for uh, drage trucks. Um, and the Port of San Diego has a truck transition plan that looks at 2030 as 100% dredge trucks servicing the port. So we have a lot of work to do, um, especially here in the region, and we want to understand what that means for the San Diego region. How many vehicles are we thinking about? How many trucks and buses specifically are we looking at 
for uh, by 2040 and then beyond. And we worked with the California Energy Commission, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and our consultants to develop uh, some estimates here for the region for 2040. And in 2040, we're looking at nearly 70,000 trucks and buses being zero emission. So that is looking like the majority of that's going to be battery electric with a smaller sliver being fuel cell. The remainder will be diesel, gasoline, and natural gas, and we'll phase those out over time. Um, and, and in order to complement that and to meet those needs, we're looking at uh, a lot of chargers and a lot of hydrogen fueling. These are estimates based on the California Energy Commission's heavy load pro model. And so the, these numbers could change. 23,000 medium duty heavy duty chargers by 2040 seems like a lot. Uh, but when you think about it in the sense of having multiple plugs per ch charging station, it, you may not, this is 23 nozzles, 23,000 nozzles. So it's, it may, you're not, not going to see 23,000 chargers region wide. The majority of those are expected to be private chargers at depots and overnight warehouses, with about 2,300 of those being publicly available chargers. Hydrogen um, may change based on the amount of storage capacity available at the hydrogen stations. Um, so this was an estimate based on small to large hydrogen stations in the region here. Um, and, and I mentioned this, as the technology changes, as the costs come down, these, these numbers and these station uh, sizes might change. And so these are estimates at this point in time. In order to meet the demand for both the vehicles and the infrastructure, and specifically the infrastructure, we developed some siting criteria, some best practices that local governments can use, that private en entities can use um, to, to deploy infrastructure for zero emission trucks and buses. And we're really looking at utilization, uh, being able to, to leverage areas that have high vehicle volume already that are passing through uh, corridors that you know service these trucks and buses already, uh, land use areas that have the space and will not impact traffic and, and, and you know increase congestion, and then equity, making sure that we're distributing these chargers and this infrastructure region-wide, um, and that we're not bringing additional truck traffic to any one location uh, just because there's chargers and infrastructure there. So we want to make sure that that really the truck traffic is really based on the needs of the truck traffic rather than magnifying uh, a certain community having truck traffic. Grid capacity is also huge. Having the grid to be able to service the, the, the infrastructure um, is, is important. So working early with the grid and the utility is, is going to be important in order to be able to scale up and then be able to provide those upgrades to the, the infrastructure. And then uh, some of the more traditional planning things like flood risk, if you have uh, charger stations and you, you may be in a flood zone, you got to think about how that's going to impact the, the availability of the chargers. Same thing with wildfire and, and uh, impacts for power safety shutoffs. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of barriers. Cost is number one. Infrastructure and fueling access comes along with that. Um, and energy demand complements all the, the two above. And then regulatory support is really what's going to uh, be part of that. Like regulatory support needs to change in order to uh, bring down the costs, allow quicker infrastructure access, and then uh, increase the amount of energy that's being able to be delivered to these locations. Uh, technology readiness and awareness is also very important, making sure that we have the workforce available and that the owners and operators are aware of the potential technologies that they can use to meet their current routes and operations. So in order to address these barriers, we developed these uh, five buckets of strategies. They're, these are not, they're not just five strategies total, but they have you know, some, some sub buckets within that. Um, utility coordination, permit streamlining, to be able to bring the infrastructure, uh, sorry, energize the infrastructure and get that infrastructure in the ground quickly is important. Uh, incentive programs can address costs of both vehicles and the infrastructure itself. Uh, Public-private partnerships are going to be huge in order to allow for infrastructure to benefit the private sector as well as the public interests. Um, it's good. And then policy and regulation, uh, you know, supports the, those, those three above. Um, one of the things that is, is a challenge right now is batteries weigh a, a bunch, you know, anywhere from 8,000 to 15,000 pounds. And so when you think about a truck uh, traveling today on, on today's roads, 80,000 pounds is the, the, the weight limit. And there's a 2,000 pound exemption currently. But if you have an 8,000 pound battery, even, a, you know, or a 15,000 pound battery, you're reducing a lot of goods that are being able to be transported. And so that either means that you're going to lose economic value out of that truck trip, or you're going to add additional trucks on the roads, which adds to more uh, wear and tear, more VMT. And, and similarly, the weight of these trucks adds wear and tear on the roads, adds uh, particulate matter being, uh, you know, expelled via the, the tires and the road wear and tear. So, you know, short term, maybe there's exemptions that could be done to, to allow for more weight to be traveled uh, or, or transported. But long term, that's not going to be a policy that really works because of that wear and tear, because of the additional truck traffic. And so looking long term policies uh, and technology advancements will really be supportive of being able to reduce the battery weights um, and, and allow for the, the economic uh, flows to continue. Workforce training, outreach, and engagement is also very important, making sure we have local workforce that's able to work on the vehicles and the infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I, 
I, I jumped right over this at the beginning, but I, I got to say trucks and, and buses are a smaller portion of the vehicles on San Diego County roads, but transportation is the largest leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions and trucks, uh, diesel trucks specifically are a large contributor of diesel particulate matter, air pollution. And so being able to transition to zero emission trucks and buses really does uh, bring a lot of benefit to the community's public health interest as well. Um, and so as we think about transitioning, we're looking to have this serve as a key resource for the region. We've been working on electric vehicle charging uh, and electric vehicle planning for light duty vehicles since 2010. And so we have a pretty good idea around what needs to happen in that sector. Um, but for the medium duty, heavy duty side, this is the first of its kind for the region. So this is a, a foundational document that sets the stage for the region, gives us some ideas for targets, identifies the challenges, identifies some strategies for us, and will inform regional plan near term and long term actions. And it can also support demonstrations here in the region. The Port of San Diego is working on some charging infrastructure uh, in, in San Diego. The international border community had the first truck charging station launch in Otay Mesa. And the California Transportation Commission is working on some zero emission corridors. And so uh, I think complementing the blueprint, the corridors, and um, the strategies identified, we can secure some funding for these strategies and really work towards implementing the blueprint, work towards uh, reducing the barriers to implementation for these trucks and buses. And um, I, you know, we're working with Caltrans District 11 on a feasibility study. Uh, we, we shared our blueprint with Jose and gave him some of the background of, of what we're, our assumptions are for the siting criteria so he can work on that as he looks at a feasibility study for uh, zero emission truck charging uh, on, on Caltrans properties. Um, and so we're, we're really looking to, to leverage this and work with the number of uh, public agencies, private agencies in the region. We can't do this alone at Sandag. It's going to be a regional effort. Um, and so we're hoping this really shares some best practices. We're looking for feedback and input. So, you know, I'm happy to take that today. Um, and of course, also in writing, my email will be on the last slide here. But we're looking, as I mentioned, to wrap this up this month as far as draft feedback goes, and then wrapping it up in, in January to publish as a final document. Um, as I mentioned, happy to take it, uh, take comments today as well as in an email, and we'll, we'll wrap it up and work with our, our team to, to incorporate it into the blueprint. So thank you very much for your time. Great job, Jeff, uh, without any notes. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I rode the bus down there this morning from Escondido, and on the side it says CNG. When I worked at MTS, there was a real push to go away from the diesel buses to CNG. I didn't, if I, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see that factored in. Is that something that's uh, determined to be not viable? No, no, no. Goals? So, I mean, CNG is much better than diesel, obviously. And as we started this, we were looking at uh, trucks and buses. And as we, you know, continue to work on this project, we really, the, the, the transit agencies are they have their innovative clean transit rule they, they have their transit rollout plans so they're already you know well ahead of the game as far as the transition goes they're working on those transitions they they have cng for the most part they're i think uh, mts just recently phased out their last diesel bus and so um cng to now zero emission i know that they have a number of uh, zero emission routes that they're working on the iris rapid route just launched um and so they, they're working on this and this 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 blueprint is meant to cover both sides but has really focused on the truck sector because th there is less of that um, need. And there's also small owner operators in the truck area that have less of the, the, the advanced clean fleet regulation looks specifically right now at the large fleet owners and operators um, over $50 million a year. So this is meant to help support some of the smaller owner operators thinking about how we can support the, the region's trucks flows as well as, you know, complementing the, the, the bus uh, routes as well. Okay. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to see the report on how CNG will be sustained and how the partnership with uh, hydrogen is going to work, because I know we have a, a real shortage. I believe there's two stations now, one in Del Mar, and I think there's a second one now, but uh, yep. the market is there. It just needs to have the the infrastructure to support. Yeah, and I know that there are more hydrogen stations in the pipe. Um, the uh, I think there's some TSEP funding that's it's currently been awarded for some hydrogen station development here in the San Diego region. Um, and I know that the the transit agencies are working on you know you know NTTD has their hydrogen uh, path and MTS is looking at their zero emission battery path. So it'll be really interesting to learn those lessons from those both of those rollout plans. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jeff. We better move to public comments on this item. Francesca, do we have any public comments? Thank you, Chair. We do have one public comment. The original draw, you can go ahead when you're ready. Man, this is like a horror movie waiting to happen. Um, you know, <laughs> nothing about this is sounds good because you sit and you're, I mean, I appreciate that you're talking about the, you know, trucks and how much the battery weighs and how much they their uh, load can weigh. 
but it's like you don't even consider that they're you know and especially the owner operators like that is really important because how are they even going to purchase a truck that they have to then go and pay you know to um, use the electricity to run and it's going to screw up the way that they transport goods I just don't understand and the power. There's no way the power grid has the capacity, no matter what you guys are going to do, because it already doesn't have it to do the electric vehicles and support that right now. I mean, it's like charging. If you charge your car on low, it's like a hundred homes and then you charge it on higher and it's like double that, if not more. And then you have several of those like Tesla chargers and it's like a whole neighborhood. And why is it that in, you know, as soon as Gavin is telling us that we can't have gas cars anymore, all of a sudden it's like, you know, then we're being told that we can't use our IC and we shouldn't be, you know, charging our electric vehicles. So I don't know why you think that putting every single thing under the grid like that and then expecting people to be able to just use their homes in that way and the electricity in their home, um, it doesn't make any sense. And, um, you know, it's just the fact that like why it, a person only has 10 hours to drive a load. So it's like, how far is that truck going to go before they actually have to charge it again? And then do you want them to, if they're going cross country to sit in that, that truck while it's being charged and be radiated basically, because the amount of radiation that comes off of it is crazy, but there's not enough infrastructure in other areas for them to travel from state to state like they do, but you don't care because you guys need us to not travel. Right. And you don't need people to get goods. This is going to affect you guys too. So I can't wait till you guys see that. That concludes the public comments. Thank you, Francesca. Let's go on to any other member comments or questions. Seeing none, I have a few for you, Jeff. Uh, um, I've heard that the, that right now uh, the charging stations are hard to um, develop getting permits through SDNG. Do you know any what what the time wait is like? If if a small medium um, company says I want to convert and I want to make take advantage of the state incentives uh, for for electric trucks, how can I start? It depends. Um, you know, it depends on the amount of grid capacity that currently exists at a certain location. It depends on what needs to happen at that station uh, or that location in order for upgrades. If you're looking at um, a transformer upgrade, it, it takes more time. If you're looking at a substation upgrade, it takes even more time. Um, and, you know, the, the last public comment really brings up some good points. The, the region and the state is not ready for this, these vehicles. And that's what this blueprint is meant to do. It's looking at the challenges. We're looking at how we can address those challenges. And, and so we're, we're acknowledging that there needs to be planning. There needs to be additional grid capacity brought in. Um, and, and so, you know, specifically to answer that question, it, it really does depend. Um, the utility and the CPUC has set some... Uh, some timelines for certain types of upgrades or uh, electrification efforts. Um, but it, if, if you are looking at a, um, you know, a transformer or a substation, that, that is slightly different. And so um, it, it can vary anywhere between, you know, three months to a couple of years, depending on the, 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 the type of load that you're looking at. Great. Thank you. And the other is um, you've had a great chart in terms of what the future looks like in terms of electrification, how fast uh, we're going to be moving in that direction. Uh, until we reach uh, 2040 or, or so. Um, how can we make that happen more so in the impact of communities? Uh, so we have a goal of trying to reduce uh, these particular matter from the most impacted communities. Are you looking at different uh, ways that we can help direct um, this either by charging stations or the use of these trucks in those communities to reduce uh, emissions? So I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understood. Can you, are you asking if the, like how as a region we're looking at addressing these particular matter? Because I think part of that is the, the, the signing criteria that we looked at, you know, a regional distribution of charging infrastructure and looking at potentially incentive programs uh, and working with the private sector in order to get infrastructure region wide so that we can address the smaller owner operators so that they can use public charging infrastructure and that um, we're working with, uh, and, and leveraging the California Transportation Commission zero emission corridors so that as truck flows throughout the region move, we can uh, essentially provide charging infrastructure. It's like the chicken and the egg type of thing, provide the infrastructure so that these trucks can then come out and actually use the infrastructure. Folks aren't gonna wanna buy a truck if they can't you know, use public infrastructure. Correct, so, so it may be that we, if we're looking at um, infrastructure development, that we target the infrastructure development and targeting 
charging stations for vehicles, uh, medium heavy duty trucks that essentially serve those communities, whether it be Coronado, Logan Heights, or uh, Portside communities. Um, so I'm uh, hoping that we have some kind of strategy in the plan uh, to work towards that end. Um, you know, electric trucks may be great in, in other parts of the county where we don't have that much of a diesel particular matter uh, problem, uh, but it would be great if we can make these this transition happen um, faster and more directed towards those communities that are affected the most. Absolutely, and I, I appreciate you following up because um, I, I think as one of the next step, an immediate next step for the blueprint would be to do the, an actual regional siting analysis for public charging infrastructure. I know that Caltrans is working on their feasibility study uh, for, for public charging infrastructure for trucks and buses, but we could work with local governments and, and others to, to look at uh, region-wide where infrastructure could go. This siting criteria we developed uh, we had limitations with our funding and our timeline, so we weren't able to do a regional study, but that would be an immediate next step from this blueprint. Yeah, I and mean, just to complicate, well, not complicate, but just add one factor. I, I was speaking to uh, Port Commissioner Chair Raviano this morning about how by making charging stations in these communities, like in National City and Chula Vista and, and, and uh, uh, Logan Heights, we don't want to attract more trucks to go there to get charged either. Um, we want those charging stations to serve and reduce pollution in the most impacted communities. And, and I think that's that's uh, something to keep in mind, um, as well as um, uh, the last point is, uh, I, I know Cusman Duncan and I, you know, we've we talked about uh, how the Navy is involved um, or needs to be involved with, with this transition uh, since uh, there's a major center there. Um, that's I'm sorry, Vivian Moreno, I forgot, I didn't see you hand go up. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just, two things. Um, I recently was able to tour the um, South Bay MTS charging station. And for folks who haven't done it, it's just mind blowing, right? And I got to go uh, to the Zeb conference, <laughs> um, which I learned way too much about um, charging stations. And I actually discovered that MTS is one of the leading um, agencies in the nation that has um, gone as far as getting um, these stations uh, put into our system. Um, and then the fact that hydrogen is coming into play is just it confuses me very much. But um, for those folks who haven't uh, toured, I highly, highly recommend uh, you checking it out. It's literally people from all over the nation were coming out to look at the facility. Um, and you need a lot of space. That's the number one thing that I, that was made very clear for these charging facilities. Um, but um, so I wanted to make that point. But the second point is we have a regional economy and our biggest trading partner, which is Mexico. Um, I just, I, I always, you know, I, I scratch my head at thinking how we're going to collaborate with them and, and how much collaboration is being done. Uh, currently there's 3,400 trucks that exit California, uh, that have California products going to the maquiladoras in Mexico, ready to get um, assembled products um, to assemble the products to bring back into the United States. So, um, and that's only growing, right? That the, uh, the economy we, we want it to grow. I represent Otay Mesa, so we definitely want our economy to grow. Um, I think it was fifty billion dollars of commerce um, in 2022 that um, came in and out of Otay Mesa. Um, so I'm wondering what your collaboration is with, with Mexico, uh, because they certainly do not have the infrastructure, no, nor do they have the capacity. And I understand that for a, a lot of the truckers in Mexico are, are their owner operators and the legislation is state legislation is, is different for them. But are you taking into consideration the truckers that commute back and forth into Mexico, into the United States that are very much part of the economy, right? Of the binational economy that is, like I said, very important for not only the state of California, but the whole nation, let alone here, the region in San Diego. Absolutely, it's a great point. Um, we worked on a white paper recently with our goods movement team 
Um, it's called the Cross Border Goods Movement Zero Emission Vehicle White Paper, and we're looking at we, we looked at the you know the truck traffic, the flows, and the economy, and um, how we can support some of the challenges that we're running into um, the, the cross border goods movement issues. And you know we made sure that the blueprint and the, the white paper were coordinating on some of the strategies that we were recommending, so that we can um, some one of the, 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 the strategies recommends policy sharing and lessons learned from our side of the border to to the Mexican side of the border. Um, we we've had some presentations to the California Commission of Californians, California, uh, so we can share some of our work um, and share some of the best practices that we're learning, um, trying to understand some of the challenges that Mexico is running into and, and working towards uh, maybe not exactly the same policies, but, but complementary policies and consistent policies so that cross-border goods movement that is zero emission can, can occur. Um, and we're direct, definitely looking at the international border community as an area that can support this, this goods movement, this especially zero emission goods movement um, with, with that coordination. And so there, there are definitely conversations happening um, and we're working at, as collaboratively as we can in order to, to support the, the cross-border goods movement. So you're saying the white paper isn't included it's, in this document. It's not included, but it is complimentary, and it's also available on our website. It's on the Goods Movement page, um, and it, 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 we made sure that as we developed the blueprint and the, the white paper, we were coordinating and sharing what we were learning from the blueprint effort, as well as the Goods Movement Sustainable Freight Strategy Implementation okay. work, um, and so that we were collaborating uh, with uh, Caltrans as well on that one. Um, so, Well, I think we should hear the, the white paper. It would be great to hear it. Um, and I, if you don't, uh, I'm going to say it. Um, I think it is short-sighted for us not to include um, the binational goods movement because there's such a strong component of the freight movement in the state of California. So I will share that. And I, I think it should be implemented. And it would not be a good forecast if we do not include those numbers. Um, so that's that's, I just, I want to share that. But thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. And that concludes my comments, Chair. Thank you, uh, Gustavo. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, excellent points um, brought by Council Member Moreno and also by Chair uh, Shu uh, regarding the impact of uh, ZEVs on disadvantaged communities and then on, on the border, the cross-border collaboration. So I just wanted to add that in addition to the blueprint, we're tackling those issues on specific projects. And specifically, I'm talking about the Harbor 2.0 project that we are working, Caltrans is working with the city, with the port, with the Navy, and looking at how to manage tra truck traffic in and out of the port, and particularly focusing on the, uh, the progression of the fleet towards ZEV and how are these trucks going to be charged uh, in that community. And, and the same issue with respect to the border, we are working on the OTAI Mesaís project directly with the Mexican government. Uh, in addition to the Commission of California looking into this, also there was a, a meeting in Mexico City to, to address this, how, how we're going to allow for the cross-border truck movement, northbound and southbound, and we are making provisions in the design of the OTA MSA East port of entry for the ability to uh, uh, charge zero emission vehicles at, at the port of entry as well or at the uh, commercial vehicle enforcement facility. So the blueprint is one thing, but then there's also specific projects with funding that are looking at these issues as well. And Cosman, I must go over again. Yeah, real quickly, Jeff. Have we looked at all the impacts from tourist cargo and the naval vessels and what they could reduce as far as uh, emissions if they went onto shore power? I know some do, most don't because it's not cost effective for them. And if we had that opportunity to either suggest, provide and or mandate, uh, it might be a little late for this report, but an addendum would be really interesting to see those impacts. Thank you. Yeah, so for, for this uh, project, we were looking specifically at truck traffic uh, and, and bus traffic, but uh, I know the sustainable freight implementation strategy is a, a broader goods movement uh, lens. And so they're looking at uh, different types of goods movement. So marine, uh, rail, uh, and then traditional like truck traffic. Um, so they have a little bit more strategy there around shore power, and that's definitely incorporated in there. Their yeah, strategy. And I think what, what really got me thinking of that was uh, Council Member Moreno's comments about disadvantaged communities. And when you start thinking about it geographically, we're looking at from where we are sitting here today, south to the border, because that's where the Navy sits primarily. And that's where our cargo ships come in and our cruise ships just right a couple of blocks from here. So it does tend to be focused in this part of the county. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Jeff. This is an important item for us, as you can tell from our comments. So thank you very much for, for the report.
I think that concludes our meeting. Uh, uh, so, or of our agenda items. Uh, with that, our next transportation committee meeting is scheduled for Friday, December 15th at 9 a.m. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Oh, uh,